Hello, my name's Vivian Cook. I work at the University of Newcastle and I've been asked by TESOL Academic to give you a talk about some of the key ideas that I think are useful from second language acquisition research for language teachers. This is going to be what I would call a fireside chat. Fireside chat was invented by Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I believe, but in England it was famous for J.P. Priestley's talks during the Second World War. In the first part, I'm going to talk a bit about whether people who know two languages are special. Often we think that when we're learning another language, all we're doing is adding something to our skills rather than changing our lives in all sorts of ways both outside and inside our minds. First of all, let's have a look at the sheer numbers of people who know second languages in the world. If you take the European Union, there's something like 438 languages spoken in the Union. If you take California, 42.6% of people in California have another language than English in their home. And if you go to Toronto, you find 43.5% of the people there don't use either English or French, the official languages of the, of the country, in their own homes. So what one can see from this is that really, probably, there are more people who use second languages in the world than there are straight monolinguals. So what happens to you when you learn a second language? One of the first things, really, is that you learn to think in different ways. The big example that people use of this is the question of how different languages talk about colours. In some countries, you have a word for light blue and a word for dark blue that are actually different colours. So in Greek, it's blé and galagio quite different words for two different colours, where in English we have one colour. <coughs> However, if you are a speaker of Greek who knows English, your colour sense has been changed slightly by your learning of English. And the same is true for people who speak Japanese, who learn English. After a few years in England, they start to think and categorise things in rather different ways. So your whole mind is changed in various, perhaps subtle, but definite ways by the experience of learning another language. Even, in fact, some people believe that it can help with Alzheimer's disease. People who speak two languages tend to get Alzheimer's about five years later than people who are monolinguals. What also happens sometimes is that your first language changes. People talk a lot about how the second language is affected by the first. Very few people talk about how the first language is affected by the second. Yet it's now quite clear that once you know another language, your first language isn't quite the same. For example, how you process the sentence. If you have one particular way of finding out the subject of the sentence by deciding it's the first thing in the sentence or deciding that it's the animate noun in the sentence or deciding that it has to agree with the verb, then when you come to a second language, you have to learn another way of finding the subject of the sentence. And this affects you in your first language. You won't be processing the sentences of your language in quite the same way because you know another language. It's also been shown for some aspects of pronunciation. If you take sounds like p and b in different languages, these vary very subtly from one language to another. So if you're learning French and your English, you may have to change your pronunciation of p and b slightly to get the right French pronunciation or the right English pronunciation in reverse. 
whichever way you're going, you actually end up with something in the middle. If you're a French speaker, you will have a slightly English version of per and ber, and if you're an English person, you'll have a slightly French version of per and ber. Okay, this isn't going to be a giveaway in ordinary circumstances, but it clearly shows up if you analyse the waveforms on a, on a computer. Your pronunciation of your first language has been slightly affected by the second language you know. And this applies to all the other areas of language, whether your pragmatics, your vocabulary, your intonation and so forth. All of these seem to show the effects of learning another language. A second language user hasn't quite got the same command of the first language as a pure monolingual. So the overall point is really the second language users are not just a monolingual with another language added, double monolingualism. They're people who have unique qualities of their own, who think in different ways, who have different grammars, different ways of pronunciation because of the other languages that they know. So the comparison between the native speaker and the second language user never works that well simply because second language users are different kinds of people. So what are the lessons for language teachers? The overall lesson is undoubtedly that the task of language teachers is to produce good second language users. People who are capable of using the second language for whatever reason they want to do their jobs, to go on holidays or whatever it may be, that this is the teacher's real aim, really, is to enable people to get something more out of life by knowing another language. What this then means is that, in a sense, we've been mistaken in stressing the native speaker, because this is rather little to do with native speakers. A lot of the time, L2 users are not speaking to native speakers, but to other L2 users. The native speaker is irrelevant to them. And so what we should always do is measure our learners against the good L2 user, not against the native speaker, which they could never be. One little anecdote may show the kind of benefits I think come from this. When I was at school, I learned French for probably eight years and I passed all sorts of examinations and got into university and so forth. But now, I would hardly open my mouth to speak French. I don't mind reading it and I don't mind listening to it, but I certainly won't speak it. So you could say I've got 10% of the native French speaker's competence. A terrible 10%. Wasn't I a bad student? Haven't I had a bad rate of attrition of losing the language? Or when my teacher's terrible, there must be some sort of explanation. But you can look at it another way. I've got 100% of English, more or less, and I've got 10% of French. If you add them together, I've got 110%. The 10% doesn't look very much if you consider it in terms of French native speakers, but it looks a lot if you consider it in terms of monolingual native speakers who only have 100%. Any person who learns another language is gaining something from the experience, however little they may do or however far they go. This is what teachers should be thinking about, really, is actually developing this um, idea of second language use, of persuading the students that they are actually rather good as second language users and that they shouldn't be bothered by trying to imitate native speakers whom they can never be. In the second part, I'm going to be looking a bit at how grammar is important in acquiring and using a second language. The word grammar is a bit of a scare word for many people because it reminds them of unpleasant days at school 
where they had to learn 17 different kinds of adverbial clause, for instance. Or it makes them think of the rules that English people sometimes give out about you mustn't end a sentence with a preposition or you mustn't split an infinitive and things like that. However, in second language learning research, usually grammar means the grammar in the mind. When we produce a sentence, we have to put it together. We put it together out of our knowledge of the grammar of the language, the way all the parts go together, the parts of speech, the rules, the inflections and so forth, all go together to make a particular sentence or, in reverse, help us to understand somebody else's sentence. Without grammar, sentences wouldn't fit together, wouldn't mean very much. They'd just be strings of words, strings of ideas, without a unifying structure. The first idea that people had in looking at how people develop grammar was in terms of sequence. What is the order in which we learn particular grammatical things? In first language acquisition, people had already worked out a sequence for how children learn their first language. Now people tried to apply this to second language acquisition. And what they discovered was expressed in terms of so-called grammatical morphemes. Grammatical morphemes are essentially structured words like for, to, and in, and grammatical endings like ing and s, and so on. What happens when you learn a language is that you start with, if you like, the easy ones of these, and then you gradually learn the more and more difficult ones. Usually, in a second language, people found that you start with the articles. You're first of all good at using the and a. Uh. Then you learn how to use ing, so you've got running. Then you have the plural s, as in books. Then you have the regular past tense, as in um, waited or looked. And then you have irregular past tenses, like came and went. Next you learn the possessive s, as in John's, and you learn the third person s of verbs, as in looks and waits. So you're going through a particular sequence of acquisition. This was the first major claim, I suppose, about second language acquisition, was that people learnt the grammar in a particular series of steps. And from the grammatical morphemes, you could go on to all sorts of other grammatical constructions. The idea was that you went through it step by step. And it didn't matter very much what your first language was. It wasn't just a question of transferring from your first language. It was a question of going through the same order, regardless of whether you were a speaker of Japanese or Spanish or whatever it was. Another idea was that we have a certain common structure for grammar in our minds that we use for any language. Children can apply this common structure to learn English or French or German as their first language. So in a second language, we can exploit this kind of built-in grammar in the mind. One way of doing this was to look at the idea of parameters. The idea is that there are a series of switches in your mind which you have to switch to the language you're learning. So if you're a speaker of English, you have to switch it to subject, verb, object, order, rather than verb, subject, order. If you're a speaker of French or English, you have to switch it to the idea that there has to be a subject for every sentence so that we can say that he came in rather than just came in. But if you're a speaker of uh, most of the other languages in the world, you have to learn 
that sentences don't have to have subjects. You can say came or went and everybody will understand who you're talking about because of the, the context in which you're speaking or because of the form of the verb and various other sorts of reasons. So learning another language then was setting these parameters when you're learning language for the second time you may have to reset these parameters or you may find them impossible to reset but this was one of the key concepts of second language acquisition then was that we all are trying to learn grammar using the same sort of process and simply trying to adapt to the language that we're hearing. But there's not much point to describing these sequences of acquisition in terms of grammar, phonology, and all the other things of uh, second language acquisition when we don't know the reason for it. Why do people learn a language in these sequences? And how can teachers make use of it? One of the explanations that people have come up with is that it relates to our memory in a second language. When we process a sentence, we have to remember and work with a certain number of items to put the sentence together. If we have a very limited memory in the second language, we will not be able to produce very much. And as we learn more, we'll be able to expand our memory and produce more words, bigger sentences. There's not much point, however, in knowing all these facts, the stages of people acquiring language, if you don't know why this happens. Why should people learn it in a sequence? Why should the sequence be the same, regardless of what their first language may be, or other factors in the situation, sometimes regardless of what the teacher tries to do? One of the ideas that has come up in the past 10 years for explaining this is called processability theory. This takes the idea that when we learn another language, we have a limited amount of memory available for using it. We start with a very limited memory and we gradually expand it. So the stages in our acquisition will be due to the expansion in the amount that our memory processes can handle. For example, according to people who study this particular theory, people start with a one-word phase in which they produce words by themselves, really, usually content words. So, husband, fly, Paris, Thursday. Isolated words strung together just into a sequence, but not put together into a sentence in any sort of way. The second stage, function words start coming in. So you might hear husband fly to Paris on Thursday. The one word Paris and Thursday have become two words to Paris and on Thursday. At this stage then, the um, learner can put a function word with a content word to get a two-word phrase. At the third stage, the learner can assemble this into really proper phrases. So, my husband will fly to Paris on Thursday. Each of those is a phrase of English built up out of a couple of words, but nevertheless linked together grammatically. The fourth stage, the learner can assemble all of this into a complete sentence. So you get, my husband will fly to Paris on Thursday. Everything has gone together into one structure, but this can only happen when you've got enough in your memory capacity to be able to handle the whole structure of the sentence. Building sentences is a complicated thing, and you need spare channel capacity to be able to do it. Finally, there's a stage five in which people can add 
subordinate clauses, say clauses with if or because. So you might have, my husband will fly to Paris on Thursday if Charles de Gaulle is open. So we've now got a sentence with a clause within it, and this is the final stage that most learners get to. What we've got here then is a series of five stages that come out of the expansion of the learner's memory. And as your processing capacity gets better, so you can handle more and more complex structures, you can go from just stringing isolated words to making complex sentences with other clauses within them. So what does this mean for language teaching? The overall point, I suppose, is not to forget about grammar. Not grammar in the sort of book sense of grammar, of all these rules and nasty facts about irregular verbs and so forth, but grammar in the sense of the mental reality in people's minds. It's to do with how we organise language in our mind and how we put it together in sentences and work out the meaning of sentences. It's a vital element and we have to remember that what the students are doing are trying to put together a grammar of a new language in their minds. The other thing about grammar, I suppose, is the idea of processing. That using a language depends on processing signals that are coming in. Producing a language means sending signals to the outside world. So all sorts of steps have to be gone through to enable these processes of comprehension and production. And they seem very much to depend upon grammar. How we process the sentence depends upon the sequence in which it is heard or in which we produce it. And we have to alter it in our minds into a particular sequence. So these processes depend upon memory, depend upon other factors as well. And we have to remember, again, that the students have limited capacity in their minds and what they're doing is trying to cope with a whole sentence using a rather defective short-term memory in the second language. Well, thank you for listening. It's been entertaining putting together this little video for you. It does very much reflect my own views. I always warn my students that my views are highly idiosyncratic sometimes. If you want more information on these topics in a more formal and research-based way, you'll find it on my website and in my various books and articles. To get to my website, just Google my name or go to the address given on the screen below. Right. Bye.